Hello everyone, Sniggity here. I've not really been in the mood for making videos lately, but I did kind of promise this one back in the Ace Combat overview. And as we all know, I always deliver on my promises. Except when I don't. But I had a good reason for waiting so long this time. I've been waiting for all the DLC to be released. Yeah, that's why. So here we are. We finally have every bit of Ace Combat 7 content to digest and take a look at. This will hopefully be a pretty thorough analysis, so let's begin. By the way, there's going to be massive spoilers for everything. Ace Combat 7 was announced all the way back in 2015, and was originally intended for a winter 2017 release but was delayed to 2018, and then delayed one last time to 2019, making it the first mainline Ace Combat game in 12 years. And you thought Devil May Cry had it bad. I posed a question at the end of my series retrospective video. Would AC7 be the game that returns the series to its glory days? Is this the game that would be the true successor to the PS2 games? Well, I'm still playing it like a year after it came out, so I guess the answer is yes. Bingo! There's no dumb gimmicks like dogfight mode holding it back. This is 100% classic Ace Combat mechanics, with extremely tight gameplay and physics. But it's not without its fair share of faults that holds it back from being truly perfect. A common criticism made by reviewers was that the story didn't make any sense, which is bizarre, since the story makes perfect sense. However, what I think these people are referring to isn't the story itself, but rather how it's told. And this is perhaps the game's greatest downfall. To explain why, it's necessary to explore the appeal of these games and what makes them so great. Obviously dogfighting is really cool, but there's more to it than that. Ace Combat games have traditionally had a large emphasis on mission pacing. The mission structure is a lot like the track list of a musical album. Each track is ideally there to complement the one that came before it, after it, and the track list as a whole. Almost every game begins with a stray air-to-air -air mission against some bombers. This acts as a tutorial stage since the bombers can't dogfight and pretty much have to watch as missiles blow them to pieces. From here, we have a mix of air-to-ground and air-to-air -air missions. The longer, multiple objective-based missions from AC6 are thankfully absent here. This is much closer to the missions featured in the PS2 games, such as the timed, score-based destruction missions from AC4, and the ever-popular escort missions. Between these, though, are a variety of gimmicky missions that really help enhance that traditional pacing I was talking about. We have the old classics making a return, such as the ravine flight that they stole from Area 88, the flying fortress boss fight, and the absolutely essential tunnel run. The tunnel run is something that happens in almost every Ace Combat game, it involves an extremely dangerous flight through a tunnel to destroy something that could not otherwise be destroyed. It's mainly used right at the end of the game when the action is at its climax. This is so deeply ingrained into the series at this point that not having one feels like a cheat. AC7 brings back this tradition with its own unique twist. However, all of these are things we've seen before. And there have been some criticism that points towards this game lacking in innovation, and simply being more of the same. I'd argue that that wouldn't be a bad thing, considering how long it's been since the last real game. But it's also not even true. AC7 brings an absolutely fantastic new mechanic to the table, that both complements the old formula and innovates it. I'm referring to the turbulence and weather mechanics, an inexperienced pilot may find themselves losing their bearings while flying through the clouds. 
Your missiles lose accuracy, your aircraft becomes unstable, and you can even ice up if you spend too long in there. This isn't just added realism, however. It's also one of your main obstacles during certain missions. The most memorable example of this can be found in my favourite mission, which has you flying through a valley while being blown by strong winds. If that wasn't enough, the second half introduces lightning into the mix, which can strike your aircraft and send you off course. This mission is also your first encounter with enemy ace Mihai, and what follows is an intense dogfight through treacherous weather. Not only do all of these elements make for a visually striking set piece, but an engaging bit of gameplay as well. The two finally come together in a way they couldn't in Assault Horizon. The weather is an added layer of intensity to these already fairly intense dogfights. It gives a sense that enemy pilots aren't your only hazard during missions. You're also up against the elements. While almost every mission has some clouds for you to fly through, most of them don't have thunder or sandstorms. It's a mechanic that adds variety to the campaign missions without being too gimmicky or annoying. Which brings us back to that fantastic mission pacing I mentioned earlier. It's like an album of great songs. Sometimes quite literally, because this game has a really damn good soundtrack. No, just once taking Each mission is visually distinct in a way that you don't often see in a game with photorealistic graphics. There's a great use of colours and scenery that makes every area distinct and memorable. Not to beat that dead horse once again, but it's much more interesting than the boring greys and browns that littered Assault Horizon. Jesus, in terms of gameplay, AC7 is perfect in its pacing. However, this doesn't quite extend to its storytelling, which, as I mentioned earlier, is its greatest downfall. This is an important area to analyse, because AC7 is, more than any other game in this series, a sequel. It assumes you have prior knowledge of Strange Reel and have, at the very least, played AC4 and 5. It's a culmination of over 20 years of games. I can imagine it'll be slightly overwhelming for first-time players. And that's ignoring all of the other information the game throws at you and expects you to remember. The plot of AC7 is difficult to surmise for this reason alone. The game begins with Avril Mead, an aircraft mechanic who is thrown into prison for accidentally breaking wartime aviation laws. About five minutes after the Kingdom of Arusia launches a surprise attack on Osea. Not to get sidetracked, but can you really get into trouble for something like that when there's reasonable doubt that you didn't know? Nevertheless, she's taken to a phony airbase with a penal military squadron. Osea have become so desperate for good pilots, they've started to send convicts on legit military operations. Avril is not our protagonist, however. At least, not the one we take control of. In a similar vein to previous games, we play as a voiceless protagonist named Trigger. A man who is framed for the assassination of President Harling. The hero of the Circumpacific War and the man who spearheaded the construction of the space elevator. Osea's former president, Mr. Harling. Trigger is sent to the 444th Squadron along with Avril and a myriad of other convicts. This is the premise that was sold during much of the game's marketing. A ragtag band of misfits who have no choice but to go on almost suicidal missions. Champ, this is the control tower. You're not cleared for takeoff. Obey orders. Go to hell. This is a great idea, as it allows for a lot of interesting radio banter between the characters. One of the things the series has always done really well. Shut the hell up. This has nothing to do with me. You guys are celebrating, but I don't hear anyone saying all targets have been taken down. Each character is there for different crimes, so they all have their own clearly defined quirks. 
We have the guy obsessed with gambling, the anarchist, the fraudster, and so on. My favourite of these is Full Band. The guy who just cannot stop talking about classified information, leading to some interesting friction with the AWACS. The threat of solitary confinement is mentioned so often in this part of the game that it almost feels like a running joke. Toss the chump in solitary once he gets back. This whole story is just fantastic, but unfortunately it's a poor representation of the game as a whole, because it's only a small part of the campaign. There's actually three main story arcs that the 20 mission campaign is divided into. The first four missions have you as a pilot in the IUN, trying to reclaim the space elevator. The penal unit happens between missions 5 to 10. So that great premise I was talking about only covers about a third of the game's length. The third and final section of the game has Trigger pardoned, and transferred to the Long Range Strategic Strike Group. Only a single con is sent here with you, your wingman, Count. So all of those lovable characters you've spent the last few missions getting to know feel completely wasted. Same goes for all the characters you encounter during the first part of the game at the IUN. They're just never mentioned again. And this brings us to one of my biggest issues with Ace Combat 7. It mishandles its characters in very, let's say, unique ways. The majority of its cast are only featured as voices on the radio or during the mission briefings. Its cutscenes, on the other hand, feature a completely different set of characters, and rarely do the two cross over. It's very similar to the framework used in previous games in the series. The first, and debatably best use of this can be found in AC4, with the storytelling boy, whose cutscenes added depth to both the world and the main antagonist. However, in this game, we don't get just one narrator, but three. Avril, Dr. Schroeder, and Princess Cassette. Avril's role in the beginning of the game is pretty basic exposition. From here, her role becomes increasingly unclear, though. She's the resident expert on repairing supersonic planes. It's even implied she's the reason Trigger's plane isn't falling apart between missions. I decided to give this guy's plane a little bit of the old Avril magic touch. He needed all the help he could get. In any other game, she might be the character you go to to purchase new planes and equipment. That isn't the case here. She's barely even mentioned during this part of the game, showing up only in the odd cutscene here and there. One of these is interesting because it includes a character from your squadron. Tabloid, the anarchist. The only member of your squad that appears in one of these cutscenes. You'd expect them to stick with your protagonist to the end of the game, but they don't do that either. Trigger and Count go off on their own little journey to advance the plot, and Avril and Tabloid are sent to the front lines, where they are missing from the plot until they meet Cassette at the end. This finally leads us to Avril's true purpose in the plot, downing the shields on the arsenal bird so Trigger can destroy it. It honestly feels like they didn't know what they wanted to do with this character. She could be removed from the story entirely and not much would change. Everything she does is either unnecessary or could be done by another character. I mentioned that she initially fixes up Trigger's plane and prevents its engines from burning out, but who is doing this when she's not there for a good chunk of the game? Didn't you know? Exactly, some nameless mechanic. It's like they keep forgetting why she's in the narrative in the first place since her role keeps changing. Even the very thing she's introduced with. Flying a plane is never done again. This same problem also extends to Tabloid, who is a former member of your squadron and can totally fly a plane, but never does again after he's sent to the front lines. He gets a fair bit of character development in cutscenes, but is killed off-screen, and not even in a plane. 
His only role in the story seems to be to imply that not all Belkins are scheming warmongers. That's just a stereotype. Hashtag not all Belkins, hashtag Belka did nothing wrong. Okay, on a somewhat unrelated note, there's some really bad dialogue in this game. For an anarchist, he struck me as a bit weird. Because anarchists are known for being totally normal people, right? Right now! The rest of the characters at least have clearer roles in the story. Princess Cassette's story arc is about learning how she's a pawn of the Erujian government for propaganda purposes, and attempting to atone for the damage she's done. Mihai's arc is my favourite though, as he's probably the most three-dimensional character of the bunch. He's an ageing ace pilot who desperately clings to the one thing he truly cares about. His dominion in the sky. He comes out of retirement to provide flight data for the advanced AI drones built by Dr. Schroeder. This turns out to be a deal with the devil though, as this leads to the drones threatening to plunge the world into a state of endless war. Mihai's honor as a pilot had been twisted into something monstrous and inhuman. Thematically, his story is a great bridge between Ace Combat 4, which is about honor and humanity between even enemies. Here's something worthy of praise. Even among the enemy there are men like this. And Ace Combat 3, which is about the removal of that humanity to create an unfeeling killing machine. <laughs> Mihai still has enough of his honor left to turn his back on the drone project at the cost of never being able to fly ever again. The main theme of Ace Combat 7 is obfuscation and uncertainty. The event that kicks the plot into motion is left intentionally ambiguous, but we're given two possible options to choose from. It's either that President Harling tries to crash his helicopter into the space elevator, realising that the structure was a source of conflict and had to be destroyed, or that he sacrificed himself to defend it from an incoming missile. It's this uncertainty over his motives that creates a divide between the characters, showing how the same event can be interpreted differently depending on the person's ideology. This is referred to in the game as Harling's Mirror. They're looking at Harling, but they're also looking at a mirror into themselves. What was going through Harling's mind when, when he was trying to destroy the very thing that so many people were sacrificed in order to create? Cassette believed the former because she had been inundated with erosion propaganda. She believed that the space elevator was being used by Osea to exploit Erusia and chose to ignore any altruistic motives for her own warmongering ends. Of course, we the Ace Combat fan know Harling's actual motives. We're never outright told what it is, but it's heavily implied. And anyone who remembers Harling from AC5 knows he is anything but dishonest. He tried to defend the tower because he wholeheartedly believed in what it represented a humanitarian effort that would hopefully bring an end to conflict. Cassette later hears about this from Avril, and realises that she had a large part in spreading this uncertainty. This theme of uncertainty is the true antagonist of the story. Towards the last act of the game, all of Osea's satellites are destroyed, throwing the world into a state of complete chaos. Communications are cut, and it becomes unclear who is friend and who is foe. During these missions, you have to visually identify targets to avoid friendly fire. The world has been thrown into a state of uncertainty. It's only when the characters realise who their true enemy actually is do they come together and dispel the uncertainty. And that enemy, once again, turns out to be the Belkins. That's right. I'm Belkin, born and raised. The country that destroyed itself 20 years ago and now seeks its revenge by breeding wars. That's just a stereotype. Hashtag not all Belkins, hashtag Belka did nothing wrong. But how do the Belkins go about doing this? They work from the shadows to create tensions between nations. 
and sow the seeds of hatred and mistrust. Basically, they're creating uncertainty. The skies have well and truly become unknown. But uncertainty isn't always a bad thing as we see at the end of the game. The space elevator itself is a step into the great unknown of space exploration. Again, more allusions to that corporatist advanced future from AC3. Nevertheless, it ends on an uplifting and hopeful note. A hint that maybe Harling's altruism, his desire to bring humanity to a brighter future, would be fulfilled in his absence, by none other than the Erusian princess who sought to destroy it, and possibly even the Belkin scientist Dr. Schroeder. Towards the end, Dr. Schroeder is presented with Harling's mirror, and chooses to at last let go of his vengeance. I wonder which path you would choose when looking at Harling's mirror. Essentially, he chooses to believe in Harling's future, which may indicate that the Belkin storyline has finally come to a close. As you can see, the story itself makes perfect sense if you pay attention to it. It's a great entry into this universe that manages to tie into just about every other entry in the franchise. For example, we see the missing link between the Zone of Endless Drones from AC2 and the advanced artificial intelligence found in AC3. There's also quite a few missions that are more direct references to previous games. There's a mission where you defend Stonehenge, the complete opposite of your mission in AC4. It's one huge love letter to Strange Reel. However, as we've looked at, it has a lot of problems with its characters. Why is it that the game has near-perfect gameplay pacing, but not so great story pacing? The obvious answer is that the pacing of the gameplay was prioritised over the pacing of the story. The scale of the story and sheer volume of events and characters really warranted a longer campaign, but they bit off more than they could chew. It was a balancing act that didn't quite work out the way they had hoped. Given its notoriously troubled development, it's a miracle the game was released at all, let alone to mostly positive reviews and fan admiration. A mainly single-player flight game was a difficult sell for Bandai Namco, who had little faith that it would do well in a modern, free-to-play, lootbox-infested gaming market. Its director, Kazutoki Kono, was almost taken off the project at one point, threatening its cancellation. The theme of uncertainty is even woven into the game's very development. Kono and his team nevertheless persisted because they love Ace Combat, and wanted to please the fans. Whatever problems I may talk about here, it's important to remember this. This was, well and truly, a dev team that cared about what they were making. This isn't really a game that's carried by its narrative. It's there, and it adds context to what you're doing. But what makes this game great is how it pulls you in with its pacing. It's fast and frantic, and in this way, it does a better job at capturing the essence of dogfighting than any other game yet. It's moved forward by adrenaline fueled action and an awe-inspiring soundtrack, which is crescendoed with this song. song specifically designed to bring harmony to the story and gameplay, and give the player goosebumps. And I think that's Ace Combat 7 in a nutshell. It's an emotional journey through this classic 20-year-old franchise. The goosebumps are there for those willing to invest themselves into it, and no amount of issues I might bring up here will ever change that. We're not quite done yet though. 
because there's a bunch of other extra content that I wanted to take a look at. The first of these is the acclaimed VR mode that is exclusive to PlayStation VR, at least at the time of making this video. Early in development, the entire game was rumoured to be in VR, and this may have been the original plan, but it never quite happened. There's still a lot of people that feel burned by this. I was disappointed to hear that the VR mode would only be a free mission mini campaign. However, after playing the main game and then these VR missions, I completely understand why they chose to do it this way. The VR missions are amazing, but the dev team were clearly working within hardware limitations whilst making them. If the entire game were like this, it would also be under the same set of limitations, making for a very dull campaign, I would imagine. These missions just don't have the same graphical fidelity present in the main game. There's no big cinematic battle with a flying super weapon. Just simple air-to-air -air dogfights and an air-to-ground bombing run. This would be run-of-the-mill without the VR, but with it, it's anything but. They feel incredibly intimate. You can feel the difference between yourself, the pilot, and the movements of the plane. They both move independently, and yet you have a high degree of control over both. This is something that just isn't possible outside of VR. You control the plane, but you never feel like you control the pilot. Here you move your head to spot other aircraft, which doesn't sound all that impressive, but is very immersive. At one point, you're told that there's an unknown radar spike from above, so of course, you quickly look up. Movies one, above. The game doesn't really tell you to do that, it's just instinctive. It's the small things like that that separate it from the main campaign. The graphics may not be as good, but the sound design absolutely is. In fact, it feels completely different from the sound design of the main game. You hear the roar of jets passing by, and the rattling of your aircraft as you fly through clouds. It's also worth noting that the VR missions have you play as Mobius-1, the protagonist of AC-4. That's why I put in a request to have you assigned to the newly established IUAPKF. That look in your eyes tells me you haven't lost it, that's what I hoped. You can unlock Mobius-1's signature F-22, but it requires playing 10 missions, and considering there's only 3 of them, it means a lot of grinding. There's also another mode where you watch an air show, but this is only of interest to huge aviation nerds. Lastly, we have the DLC missions, which is more of a third additional campaign than a series of extra missions. The free tell a standalone story that takes place in the middle of the main campaign, specifically between the Bunker Buster mission and Cape Rainy Assault. It's about hunting down a rogue erosion submarine called the Alicorn, and you're aided by a new character called David North, an analyst with an AI companion named Alex. These cutscenes are definitely of a different flavour to the main campaign, taking place entirely at David's desktop. The interesting thing about David's story, though, is that it's a meta-commentary on Ace Combat itself. It deconstructs the idea of an exceptionally skilled pilot who is capable of altering the course of the entire war. The captain of the Alicorn is so good at keeping his men alive, they'll follow him to the ends of the Earth, even if it means betraying their country and killing millions. It's a villainous inverse of the protagonist Trigger and Strider Squadron, who have the motto, stick with Trigger and you'll make it. The DLC missions are of the same level of quality as the campaign missions. Its third and final mission acts as a fantastic conclusion to the game as a whole, ending with one final hurrah for the pilots of Strider Squadron. He walked all over it with his dirty boots, over the crisp white sheets of my bed that I had just made! There's one last thing I haven't looked at, that's mainly because I haven't played it. I did, however, get my assistant to play it in my stead. 
Not that one, though. That one is taking her only day off in six years. Allow me to regale you with my tale of my experience with the Ace Combat multiplayer. Now, I'm no ace when it comes to Ace Combat, this being my first experience with the franchise, but I did find a strategy that worked for me. The Ace Combat multiplayer works on a point-based system. You'll need to do damage to other planes in order to accrue points for your, both yourself and for your team. The points that you accrue during this match will translate into in-game money that you can use to upgrade your planes. But just as important as doing damage is also not being damaged yourself. It is relatively easy to avoid damage if you play PvP using 100% evasive actions. Your teammates will appreciate this. If you can distract some of your opponents without dying, you will be a net benefit to the team. See, what you do is get close to the action, and then proceed to endlessly spiral upward, and then dive back down into a tailspin, all the while having your opponents pursue you with the intent to dominate, and put an end to your beautiful aerial dance. There. That's my pro gamer tip. But the real question is, was it fun? Was it fun? Was it fun having real sentient humans driven by the pleasure of the chase itself? Reveling in the release of competition free of the anxiety of the unknown. Ace Combat Multiplayer. In the duel amongst its players is the certainty that the victor will be victorious because of his mettle. Because he is more worthy. His wings were wiser. A beautiful metaphor for life itself. And it always ends in satisfaction. Or having to quit the game because your mother is yelling down the basement stairwell because your chicken tendies are ready. Your chicken tendies are no, ready! No, no, Mom! I'm trying to record my YouTubes! Chicken tendies! In a mirror, Mom! <coughs> yeah, the multiplayer is fun. Firing homing missiles.